So today I thought to talk about a subject that's very important, and these are some of the conditions for good relationships. Um, in the, the Buddha referred to them as like uh, uh, initiating or yeah, starting a good relationships and maintaining them. And this is very important for all of us. We're in relationships, aren't we? So I think this is a, it's a very practical, down-to-earth teaching that uh, this is a hallmark of the Buddha's teaching. They're always useful, they're always practical. Of course, people can talk about the philosoph philosophical aspects of it, many people do, but basically he's giving us these tools, isn't he, to help us to find happiness, to help us to uh, reduce and eventually completely uh, eradicate unhappiness, dukkha we call it. So this is very useful, as I say, we're all in some relationships or rather. Even monks and nuns, we're in a relationship, we live in a community, so we have to live with each other. So these are important um, the, uh, suggestions that the Buddha has. And it's, it's good to see what the Buddha is actually talking about when all his teachings are addressing two things, causes and conditions and the results. And it's for all of us to investigate what causes and conditions lead to the results we wish to promote, develop. And up to us which, what, which ones we develop. We can develop the positive, the wholesome, causes and conditions, and they will give rise to wholesome uh, or positive results. Or we can develop the negative, the unwholesome causes and conditions and give rise to unwholesome and negative results. You might think that surely people are not doing that, but if you see the world and you see what people are developing in their minds, you know, you know a lot of hatred, rage, a lot of sense of self, a pride, and all these sorts of things, then you realize how true this is. But the thing is, most people don't realize they have a choice. <laughs> they think it's just natural, and they're letting the minds run wild. So what do the, how did the Buddha use this term? And I was just going to, in uh, traditional Buddhist countries, they usually start with a gata. This is very traditional, isn't it? I think most people, many people here from Sri Lanka, maybe people from Thailand or Burma, it's the same. You know, you start a teaching with a gata. And I think I'll ask a question about this one. So I'll do it in Pali so people may recognize it. Mata pitu upatana putadara sasanga ho anakula jakamanta etang mangala mutamang. People recognize that one? Where is it from? Do you know? Yes, Mahamangala, exactly got it. So how does that translate? This is a more important thing too. It's very nice to have the Pali, it brings us all together. You know, it doesn't matter what your language is, you can chant the Pali. So, in, in English it translates as serving or supporting one's mother and father. And this important word for the day is sangaho, and this means maintaining or sustaining. And maintaining a wife and children, and an honest or an uncomplicated, a simple occupation. These are the highest blessings, and this is the Mahamangala Sutta. So, the Buddha, what the Buddha was talking about uh, as helping, being good causes and conditions for relationships, supporting relationships, starting relationships, are four things. And he called this Sangaha. This is a Pali word for it. Sangaha vot, uh, Votuni. So, the basis for a maintaining or initiating, attracting relationships. And he said, this is the English translation, because there are these four means of sustaining or maintaining a good or favourable relationship. What for? Giving, this is dana, of course, isn't it? And uh, kind speech, this can be endearing or pleasant speech, helpful actions and impartiality. And I'll talk about that later. That seems like a strange one, doesn't <laughs> impartiality? But it means actually treating others as one would like to be treated. And he says, these are the four means of sustaining uh, or maintaining a good relationship. And this term, sangaha, actually it means literally inclusion, bringing together, holding together. And this is what we need to um, put the effort into. Often when people get married, you know, they think that's, that's the, sort of like the end of the story. It's actually the beginning of the story, isn't it? There's a lot of work that goes on holding together as a couple, holding together as a family. 
and realizing how we can do that. And this is quite a practice. So it's for bringing and holding people together and for starting and maintaining relationships. And the Buddha gave a nice, in one of the uh, uh, suttas, he, he talks about this. He, he gave some verses on it and he says, and it emphasizes the importance of this actually, giving, endearing speech, beneficent conduct, this is helpful conduct actually, and impartiality under diverse worldly conditions as appropriate in other words, as it is suitable to fit each case, these means of sustaining a favorable relationship are like the linchpin of a rolling chariot. We don't have chariots these days, but I often think of trailers, they have linchpins. You have to put them in. If they come out, you're in trouble because the trailer will come off. So it's very important, the linchpin. So it's a linchpin, these qualities. If there were no such means of sustaining a favorable relationship, a good relationship, neither mother nor father would be able to obtain esteem and veneration from their children. But since there exist these means of sustaining a favorable relationship, wise people respect them, respect their parents and respect these means. Thus they attain to greatness and are highly praised. And he said one of his disciples who, it's interesting in the uh, numerical discourses in the, the uh, book of the ones, he lists all the uh, foremost disciples, male and female, in various qualities. It's a big list. It's like, maybe it's like the Buddha giving out awards. I don't know if these people even knew that he gave them these, uh, uh, said that they were the best or the foremost in this particular quality. But in this particular quality, the best uh, or the foremost was Hataka of Alavi. Alavi. He was the foremost. And I will refer to him later how he used this quality. And the Buddha asked him some questions about how, did you, how do you use this, these qualities? And it's very important to realize too that these four qualities the Buddha is talking about, this is giving, and this is speech, a kind speech, it's helpful actions, and also impartiality. These are the way the Buddha actually attracted people. These are the way he taught um, and uh, attracted people, and people stayed because he had these qualities in, uh, you'd say, uh, developed most highly, actually, anyone. But as I mentioned before, it sustains all relationships, and family life in particular, because relationships are difficult, aren't they? We live together each day, day in, day out. And we can take each other for granted and not work, not do, uh, put in place those conditions which will actually support the relationship and maintain it and actually we give a gift. Giving, this is dana. And uh, in a very real sense, dana sustains the world because dana, this giving, it's not just material things. It's all the giving that we give time, care, attention, many, many things that we give. And if we, if the work, if we didn't have this giving, families would break down, society would break down, everything would break down actually pretty quickly. If it were only what I want, what I need. And also I say to people, if that is the case, you, you know, if it's, all about, if it's all about what I need, what I want, what I don't want, what a miserable world that is, what a joyless world that is. It's, it's, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, doesn't bring happiness to us if we just think of ourselves. And the Buddha said, bhikkhus, there are these two kinds of gifts, what two? I think most people can guess this. The gift of material goods, you know, these are the material things, important, and the gift of the Dhamma. There are these two kinds of gift. Of these two kinds of gifts, the gift of Dhamma is foremost. This is the gift of the teachings. And uh, most people will know the very famous saying, Sambhadana, uh, Dhammadana, Jinati. And this translates of, of all gifts, the gift of Dhamma excels. And this is, I mean, this is very important because why is that? I mean, first of all, you know, if a person is hungry, if they're starving, if they have no clothes, if they're freezing, like today, <laughs> then, of course, the first thing we have to address, isn't it? The kindness would be to address those things first. You have to. And the Buddha did too. There's even one famous time that he was uh, going to give a teaching, but he held up the teaching because a person hadn't arrived. And when he arrived, he said, oh, before he'd start the teaching, please give him some food to eat. 
because that person was hungry, they'd just been out uh, working. And before he gave the teaching, he made sure he had something to eat because then he could hear the teaching. He wasn't, uh, you know, overcome by hunger. Because why is Dhamma the, the, best, uh, the best gift, the, the gift that excels? Because it gives us the tools to cultivate happiness here and now, happiness in, our, in the future, in this life, and happiness in future lives, as well as attaining Nibbāna. It helps us to reduce to you know, the difficulties in our life, the unsatisfactory aspects of our life, the unhappiness of our lives. You know, the things that we find difficult to deal with. So it gives us the tools. It's very interesting. The Buddha is not saying, I'll do it for you. <laughs> just believe, I'll do it for you. He's just, he's giving us the tools and saying, go for it. <laughs> go for it. He's encouraging us. So in terms of the gift of Dhamma, you know, what we have today, you know, myself giving a teaching, that's a gift of Dhamma too. Uh, and that would have been the way, you know, that it occurred at the time of the Buddha. A monk or the Buddha would have given a teaching and people would have listened to it and taken it on board or not. Some people listened to the Buddha and, and it didn't make any difference to them at that time. At that time they had no books, videos, they didn't do live streaming <laughs> like we do now. So all those things were not possible. And so though that, that attention, you know, the attention to what they were listening to, very important, and how they listened, very important, with a sort of open, receptive mind. And of course, someone like the Buddha, enormous charisma, enormous uh, um, wisdom and peace, everything that's very attractive for people. So it would have been very easy for people to listen to him and be drawn in, have that attention, develop a sense of, we say, samadhi, one-pointedness while they're listening to him, and even develop, you know, piti, sukha, we say, this happiness and joy, and then maybe even to uh, have a breakthrough and insight while they're listening to the Buddha. It's possible. So, but also in a very real sense, you know, when we give a gift of Dhamma, it's our, it's our practice of Dhamma that we can give, isn't it? You know, if we're keeping sila, if we're keeping the ethical conduct, the uh, morality, we're protecting ourselves, but we're protecting other people along the way too from being harmed by us. You know, being harmed by they'd have no, th they need not feel the threatened that they could be killed, their property taken, their relationships broken up, uh, that that we're lying to them, and that we're coming from intoxicated state due to drugs and alcohol. So our practice of the Dhamma is very, very important. Dana, of course, is in there too as well. When we practice Dana, giving to monks and nuns, it's not that we should only give to monks and nuns, we should give to everyone and use it as part of our spiritual practice. And it's the same with Samadhi. Any uh, Samadhi, because we talk about Sila Samadhi and Panya, and Samadhi is usually developing that one-pointed uh, meditation, but it's Sati, mindfulness. And whatever we can develop in meditation is purifying the mind, reducing our negative qualities. Everybody's going to get benefit from that. We do first, and other people will as well. And of course, and along the way, as we get still, as we develop more samadhi, we can see things more clearly. The disturbances, the hindrances are reduced. Then we will develop more wisdom. And these are something, this is something other people will benefit from as well. And it's not so much what we tell other people, you know, people, many people can give good advice, but the bottom line is, are we a good example? Because it's not the words that are so important, it's where we're coming from, the example we are giving other people, giving our children, uh, giving the people we work with. So this is very important. It's often the, you know, uh, Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. And that's the way we're giving, you know, the way we give. It's very, is often more important than the actual gift, whatever it is. Because if the people pick up on that, they pick up on that, you know, you're coming from a very good place. Right. So now I'll tell a story, because it's about time for a story, I think. Keep an eye on the time, too. And I found this on the internet last night. <laughs> I hope, and maybe some of you have seen it too. I have to sort of adapt it as I go along because it make it appropriate for today, actually. And it's called Splitting the Check. And it, it, the comment here is that Americans donate approximately 2% of their disposable income to charity. I don't know if Australians it's the same. Maybe it is. Don't know. 
I know that when there are tax deductions, you know, some things are tax deductible, encourages people, <laughs> so maybe it's more. But there was a couple in America, uh, Julia Wise and Jeff Kaufman, and since 19, 2008, so that's now 10 years, isn't it? Uh, and now they're 30 and 31, they've donated, donated half their income to charity. Amazing. And it's just, it's almost 600,000 US dollars. Pretty amazing, actually. And uh, we may think, well, maybe they're fabulously rich. <laughs> they thought this is nothing. But this is 50%. I don't know. If I, if I was uh, working, could I give 50%? I don't know. Anyway, so they said, this is what uh, Julia said anyway, we have what we need, so it makes sense to share with people. And uh, they are one of them. The wife is a, uh, a social worker and the husband or the, the, uh, her companion is a computer programmer. And what's more, this is very nice, they plan to pass on, they call this the philanthropy bug, to their daughters, two, ch two daughters, one two and one six months old. And, they, and then Julia again, she said, we hope they'll grow up thinking this is a normal part of life, giving. Isn't that fantastic? That's really good. I like this because it's ordinary people. You know, that's, that's ordinary people. I mean, you might think their income's not that ordinary, really. They've got quite a good income. But to give 50% whatever your income is, is really quite difficult. They always have enough to live on. So that's a very good thing. So often in the West, you know, if coming from living in a Buddhist country, I can see how developed giving dana is in Buddhist uh, countries, but the tradition. In the West, it's not quite the same. We have a different approach to it. And to hear this, to read this, sorry, is, uh, is really encouraging, actually. So that's, that's giving, that's a gift. And you know that, you know, giving a gift really breaks down barriers, um, especially if you had arguments, disagreements, and you give a gift. That's marvellous. It really can, uh, uh, what do they say, melt the ice. It can really, you know, Make, uh, make improve the relationship immediately. So we should think of that in our relationships. You know, it's very often in families, in, in long-term relationships, we don't do that. We don't think of the little gifts now and then to give. And that makes, it lubricates, it makes the, the relationship much richer, that makes much warmer. And it means we're thinking of the other person or the other people in a family situation. And that, that thoughtfulness is, is for our benefit as well, as well as theirs. So the next one that the Buddha talks about is payalacha, and this is kind speech, or Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it as endearing speech. And the Buddha said, <laughs> this is interesting, among types of endearing speech, the best is repeatedly teaching the Dhamma to one who is interested in it and listens with eager ears. So... Firstly, you know, when in our ordinary everyday interactions, of course, the things we say are the most important, the, the source of our problems and also the source of our happiness too. Often uh, Buddha, the Buddha said we're all born with an axe in our mouth. This is speaking, speaking. this is speech, the power of speech. With, that spe with speech we can really harm, we can really hurt other people's feelings and in the process create a lot of negative karma for ourselves as well, and negativity, unwholesome states. So it's good to remember we're born with an axe. Be careful. <laughs> careful. This little tongue doesn't seem like an axe, does it? To most of it, it seems, you know, uh, just quite innocuous. But things come out, and we can't retract them. There's no delete button after we've, <laughs> we've said what we've said. We often think like, wow, what, did I really say that? <laughs> I shouldn't have. So... But the Buddha was saying that the best type of speech, again, is teaching the Dhamma to one who is interested in it and listens with eager ears. Very important there, isn't it, that he emphasised the fact that the person has to be interested. It's no good. You know, many people, when they get in, into the Dhamma, they get into Buddhism, they, they have their meditations going well, they have an understanding, they get some insight, they want to tell everybody about it. But it's good, good to remember, only if they're interested. We don't want, you know, people don't want to hear a monologue. You know, it turns them off. They think, wow, he's, you know, good for him, but I don't need to hear this. And they're not ready for it. That's the, that's the important thing, isn't it? You have to be ready, otherwise it's a waste of breath. And the other thing about uh, kind speech is, of course, that it should be 
in accord with what we call uh, right speech. Is everything okay? Are we having technical issues? <laughs> a right speech, and this is Summer Watcher. So the speech that we speak, you know, the kind speech, the, the, the uh, um, endearing speech, should be true. <laughs> that's for sure. It shouldn't just be flattery. I know people say this term, uh, flattery gets you everywhere. And it's true, but it has to be true and sincere. And in actual fact, most people pick up on it if it's not, not sincere. You know, they can just feel, wow, fake, phony, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't feel real. And the other aspects of right speech, of course, uh, coming from the Noble Eightfold Path, is it should not be divisive. We don't talk behind people's backs. And this is a very important thing. It causes a lot of disharmony in uh, uh, relationships, in communities, within societies. We don't talk behind people's backs. And when we, this sort of, the kind speech should bring harmony and unity to a situation, not division and uh, disagreement. We have enough of that, <laughs> enough of that. And the speech should be not harsh. It shouldn't be um, abusive speech. You know, the tone we speak it in, gentle, kind, um, the words we use, you know, not, uh, not swear words and things like that, words that will upset people. And this is very important, the tone in which we speak. And of course, um, Buddha is referring to uh, the best of speech being Dhamma. Our speech shouldn't be empty chatter. It should be purpose, it should be a purpose, it should have meaning. That's the ideal. Sometimes, of course, you know, we do, you know, chat, chat with people and we don't know them well, but we know if we talk about the weather or something like that, it cre creates a bit of a connection. So that can be a good icebreaker, that's the word, isn't it? Icebreaker. So very useful for that. So I'll give you now, to, just to change the tone of the <laughs> proceedings, I'm so sure some are missing these stories, is uh, an example of unkind speech. I think we're all familiar with these, so this, this probably comes as no surprise. It's a Nasrudin story. I tell these Nasrudin stories. This is, he was a Sufi teacher, holy man, uh, who's supposed to have lived in Turkey. And many of these stories, I don't know whether they actually come from him or have grown up later. But in this story, Nasrudin, who is this sort of Zen-like uh, Sufi teacher, um, he went to the royal capital and he met the king and the king spoke to him. King spoke to him and he comes back to the village and he tells everybody, oh, I went to the royal capital and, and the king spoke to me. And they are all very impressed and they're really proud. They think, oh, fantastic, Nazarudin's from our village and <laughs> the king spoke to him. But after everyone had gone away, this simple fellow came up to Nazarudin and said, what did he say to you? Nazarudin said, get out of my way. <laughs> so the king did speak to him. <laughs> But that was not kind speech. Get out of my way. <laughs> good, isn't it? <laughs> that is a, is a very good, funny teachings, but they also have a point, actually, when you dwell on them. They're teaching stories. So that's the second form of uh, uh, supportive or something that maintains or supports our relationship. So that's giving and kind speech. So the next one is, of course, helpful actions, and this is, or beneficial actions. And this is called Atacharya in Pali. And the Buddha said, among types of uh, helpful actions, the best ones are the ones that encourage, settle, and establish a person in four qualities. And these four qualities are somebody who is without faith or confidence to establish them, uh, encourage them, and settle them in uh, the accomplishment of faith. Someone that is immoral uh, or amoral to establish them in virtuous behavior, in um, sila, in, yes, wholesome behavior. Someone who's a miser, who doesn't give uh, to whoever, to accomplish, uh, to settle them and encourage them in generosity. And someone who is unwise to, uh, to establish them in, or encourage them in the accomplishment of wisdom, to develop some wisdom, some understanding of, of life and uh, the situations that we find ourselves in. So these four qualities, faith, uh, you say faith, sila, or ethical conduct, you can call it moral conduct, virtue, generosity, and wisdom. These are four qualities that Buddha encouraged all the time. And he said, if we want to repay our parents, 
and he a, a very stunning. Uh, everybody knows this, and I think stunning uh, I- image he gave, a simile we call it, of how we repay our parents. He said, if we carry our mother on one shoulder, our father on the other shoulder, and while we're carrying them on our shoulders for a hundred years, this is a long time and they urinate and defecate. We massage their feet all day. We feed them, we give them everything that they need. That's not repaying our parents. He said, we repay our parents if we establish them in faith, if we establish them in virtuous conduct, if we establish them in generosity and wisdom. That way we repay them. But he said, not if we do these other things. It's marvelous because when, when the Buddha uses these really strong images, it's hard to forget them. <laughs> You may forget all the, the details of the teaching, but that image of carrying your mum and your dad around, or one, one, each on, one on each shoulder, is pretty amazing. It sticks in my mind. I've always remembered it. So the story that goes with this, and uh, I like to say that all these other means of sustaining relationships are all a form of giving, really, aren't they? So speech, kind speech, is like a type of giving, and as he is beneficial, um, helpful actions. This one is, uh, again, another ordinary person from the same website, actually. And this person, this person uh, was uh, uh, Brenda, a 69-year-old grandmother, and she'd been waiting on a donor's list for a year to receive a liver for a transplant. And then she was notified, it says here, July 18th, so it must be this year, by the hospital, and this is in, in America, and that they had a viable liver for her, it was ready. So she'd be have to have the operation very soon. But there was, at the same time, there was a 23-year-old uh, woman, Abigail, who needed a liver. And with a, her situation was much urgent, more urgent than this woman's, other woman's. And the doctor said that if she didn't get the transplant, she could die in a day or so. So this other, other woman, Brenda, uh, they asked her if she would give up up her liver, the future liver, uh, to this uh, younger woman, Abigail. And uh, not only did she agree, she said this, and I think it's lovely. In my heart, I wouldn't have been able to live with the liver if I had let this little girl die. She's not little, really. <laughs> That's what she said. If I'd let this little girl die, I couldn't have lived with this liver that I would have received. And Having done that, she received. A, uh, she was put back on the donors list and got uh, a new liver a few days later. So that's wonderful, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, this is very much ordinary, everyday people, and uh, how they rise to the occasion. Could we do that? I don't know. <laughs> Could we do that? In Sri Lanka, it's very common, uh, quite common, for monks to donate uh, kidneys. That's, that's become quite a common thing. In Sri Lanka, there's a lot of kidney disease, and you'll see in newspapers advertising for, sometimes from a parent, actually, for their child needs a kidney um, urgently and so on. So it's, a, it's quite a common thing. And monks, uh, quite a few monks have given kidneys, so they only have one kidney left. Um, and it's, a, it's something uh, that is very, very fine to be able to do that, actually. It's very good. Think of others. So that's the third means of beneficial actions. There's so many others that we can think of, and many, many different ways we can help people, serve people, um, and so on. So the next one is, this is uh, impartiality. Remember I mentioned impartiality? It sounds a strange one, doesn't it? You think, oh, when I first read it, I thought, how can that be? <laughs> You know, surely not being impartial doesn't sound like a quality that would promote or maintain uh, relationships, but it's meant in, a, in the sense that treating others as one would like them to treat oneself, isn't it? And that is, you know, usually fairly, uh, kindly and justly, you know, so... And the Pali for that is samanat tata, tata, yes. And the commentaries to this, uh, to describe this as being... Uh, impartiality in the sense of being the same in happiness and suffering, one's own happiness and suffering or other people's happiness and suffering. So one's not a fair weather friend. We call fair weather friend. You know, somebody with good times, they're there for you. (laughs) Bad times, they're not there. (laughs) 
So this is very important. And the commentary goes on to say, this means, and this is where families can identify this very easily, it means sitting together with them, living together with them, eating together with them. This is monks, he's really talking about monks and nuns. And when we, um, uh, when we have this feeling of, in, of uh, others being of the same uh, nature as ourselves, their experiences being similar to our experience, pretty much the same actually, it's a very good basis for us to develop a lot of metta, loving kindness, compassion, to develop joy for their successes and good qualities and equanimity. It's also a very good opportunity for developing patience and understanding. Because when we see other people's uh, suffering, sometimes it can, we can get quite a lot of understanding for ourselves too. And in the, uh, evidently, the Sanskrit versions of this word, which is uh, saman natha in Sanskrit, is having a common purpose or having, a sh having shared benefits. So this draws us together very much in a family, in a relationship. If we've got a sense that we're going in the same direction, it really pulls people together. Oftentimes you see that's not the case. We're all going in different directions. And uh, that doesn't lend itself to unity and harmony in, the, in a family or a, or a relationship. If you know the husband and wife have got totally separate <laughs> interests that don't overlap at all, you know, partners have totally separate interests that don't overlap at all. That's not actually a very good condition for, for it, uh, maintaining that relationship or for de developing that relationship. And there were a few nice quotes I saw on the internet last night. You may have seen these too, about um, what we're talking about, this impartiality or seeing, other, seeing that other, what we want is what others want as well. That, that applies to them. And uh, this one was from Wayne Dwyer. How people treat you is their karma. We had a talk by Rabina Curtin on Thursday about karma. <laughs> so how people treat you is their karma, their, their responsibility. How you react is yours. That's true for all of us, you know, that's very true. It's often easier to say than do. <laughs> so, and another one they came out with, golden rule, was treat others as you would like to be treated. That's putting it simply, isn't it? That's quite nice. And uh, the Bible, of course, where's the, the famous quote from the Bible? It comes to me almost immediately when I think of this. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. That's very much so important. And I was hoping to show you a, a photograph that I'm using to illustrate this point. But I'll have to describe it because we can't put it on the screen at the moment. I think later we may be able to do these things, that would be good. But in this photograph, there is a picture of a man. It must be in America, I think. And there's a six-lane highway, three lanes either side. And he's walking. You see the photograph. You see him walking with this big signboard, almost, you know, right down the front of the body. And on it, it reads, just this is what it reads. It just reads, need kidney for wife and then telephone number. And you see that, this man walking down this busy highway with that. There's also another photo which, which uh, and then it you know, brings up an even more emotional response. You see his wife, or you see what, a woman who p you presume is his wife, and him uh, next to her crying for her, presumably. That's, that's the message. So that's just extraordinary, isn't it? You know, he's putting himself very much in her place and uh, going that, being willing to, to go out. Would we be willing to go out on a busy road, say Dandenong Road with a sign like that? <laughs> wife needs kidney, uh, need, need kidney for wife, it was. Uh, it's just wonderful that uh, someone could do that. And it's very touching. The caption they give it, it's very interesting. I mean, one can go into this as a whole other talk, is the way we perceive things is a very interesting thing. Uh, so we, you know, we perceive that in a particular way, but it's not necessarily, um, you know, there are many other ways we could perceive it. And how do we use these four means of uh, sustaining or maintaining relationships? And this comes from the, uh, again, from the numerical discourses of the Buddha. Uh, this is the Book of the Eights, and this is from Hataka. Remember I mentioned he was the best, the, the foremost exponent of sustaining relationships, initiating and sustaining relationships. And interestingly enough, 
This is what the Buddha, this is a bit of an abbreviation. And the Buddha asks uh, Hataka of Alawi, he says, your retinue is large. He comes to see the Buddha with 500, they always say 500, <laughs> 500 people. So it's quite a large number, a large number of people anyway. He says, your retin retinue is large, Hataka. How do you sustain this large retinue? How do you, how do you, how do they, you know, you keep them together? And this is what Hataka said. He said, I do so, Bhante, the Buddha, by the four means of sustaining a favorable relationship taught by the Blessed One, the Buddha. And he says, this is how he does it. And this is how we can do it. This is very, very useful. When I know this one is to be sustained by a gift, I sustain him or her by a gift. When I know this one is to be sustained by endearing speech, I, I sustain him or her by endearing speech. When I know this one is to be sustained by beneficent conduct, this is helpful actions, I sustain him or her by beneficent conduct. When I know that this one is to be sustained by impartiality, putting ourselves in the other person's shoes, I sustain him or her by impartiality. And then, very interestingly, I think this is a very, very down-to-earth practical uh, point, <laughs> very good point, you'll appreciate too, I think. And then he says to the Buddha, there is wealth in my family, Bhante. They don't think, these people that come with me, they don't think they should listen to me as if I were poor. <laughs> so he's, he's adding that, that practical point that he is in a respected position, actually, because his family is wealthy, probably uh, uh, also a respected family in the community. So, and this is why they will also listen to him. So those four means, then, for each of us, we just have to reflect, what does this person need? What could I give them? that would be useful, you know, whether it be a gift, whether it be saying something nice, whether it be an action. Well, actions, you know, we have that saying in English, don't we? Actions speak louder than words, <laughs> that's what we say. And, uh, or whether, you know, it's coming from, you know, putting ourselves in their place, realising that we are all in the same boat in what we call samsara, the cycle of endless births and rebirths, endless uh, coming to new... Uh, births and so on. So those four ways of, of uh, um, promoting, sustaining, nourishing a relationship, initiating a relationship, are very useful. And I think when I talk, when I read this, I'm sure all of you know this from your own experience, but it's good to hear the Buddha say it too, and to say how important it is, because then we will start, we will bring that to mind more. We may think, you know, you may think these these means when we think about them, oh, they just, you know, do not think greatly a great deal of them. But the Buddha is placing quite an emphasis on emphasis on them. So we too should develop these four qualities: these sangha, sanghaha, watuni, the basis basis for maintaining or nourishing a relationship. So I hope that has been useful for you and um, that we can practice it in our lives. Because, you know, sometimes we, we, we may not realize, we, we may have a mistaken view that our family lives, our relationships at work, our relationships in the monastery are an obstacle to our practice. They're getting in the way. They're, they're not allowing us the time. They're actually the ground. They're actually our meditation object in a sense. This is where we are practicing in our daily life, in our families, in, in our work environments, in the monastery. These are very important. These are our tests, but they're also where we develop and grow wisdom too. When we sit on the cushion, when we do uh, walking meditation, this is where we're actually uh, doing, we're uh, uh, purifying the mind, we're settling the mind, we're giving, developing qualities we can take into our daily life. So we shouldn't think of these other things, you know, work, family or um, living in a monastery as obstacles. In fact, they're very, very important. Our practice is 24-7. It's uh, the mind we take with us everywhere. This is our practice. And so it's very important that we develop the wholesome and we let go of the negative, the unwholesome. This is, this is the essence of the whole of the Buddha's teaching. So, so I hope you have success with that and just try it out. 
No, giving a gift is a very good one. But you see also kind words are very good too. And um, also be beneficial actions or helpful actions are very, very good. And seeing others in terms of our own experience too is very useful. It gives us a basis for, for really communicating, really understanding the universal uh, truths that the Buddha is t pointing to. So we're all in the boat, same boat actually. <laughs> And uh, this is very helpful for our practice. And it means we can really give loving kindness. We can really give compassion, really give joy for other people's success and upeka to equanimity. So I'd like to finish there and ask if there are any questions from the floor. This sounds like parliament, I think. <laughs> I hope there are no angry questions. <laughs> there may be questions from the internet too, I think. Uh, Shri Ruth, uh, Shri Ruth uh, uh, Juth uh, mentioned it. Are there any tough questions? <laughs> One from the floor here. Yeah, all right, that's good. Ajang, you mentioned um, generosity, and uh, you know, there's ways you can give, there's ways you can give what you don't need. Yes, right. that's true. You can give um, yes. what's needed, mm. and you can also give what's really um, mm. dear to you. Yes, and it's very hard to give. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about generosity, which which one of those is it, or is it all of those? Well, it's all of those. But uh, I think uh, the commentary calls giving what you don't need is like uh, uh, a pauper. Like giving like a pauper. <laughs> it's very poor. You know, it's just giving what you don't need. You just give it away. But that's better than not giving, isn't it? It's still good. It's still good. And then uh, um, the other ones, the, the commentary is trying to think of it. I know the highest was giving like a king, you know, is giving what you really like, what you really want, as it were. But I know from my own practice that sometimes... Uh, you know, giving, I get a lot more joy from giving something sometimes that I would like, but I prefer to give it, and I get a lot of happiness from that. And that is giving like a king, actually, when you give something that's very difficult to give. You know, whether it be, you know, in this case, that woman who gave the liver, as it were, that she was due to get, she gave that. You know, she didn't necessarily have the certainty that she'd get another one or that she wouldn't die beforehand. So that, that is very much like a king's giving, they say, you know, like the supreme giving. So, and giving what is needed is, is a very important thing too because uh, that, that is, a, in a sense, higher than just giving things away because you don't need them. You may want to get room. <laughs> People want to get room so they give the old stuff away and make room for the new stuff. But giving what's needed is very important too. And you see that, uh, um, you know, in everybody's life. You, if you give what is needed, you're actually thinking, aren't we? We're thinking about what's that person really need rather than just say, you know, oftentimes you'll just get a gift and we haven't thought about it at all. You just want to give something. It doesn't matter what. And then uh, it may not be needed. So that is always good. But one thing that I always emphasise, don't let our giving, let, don't let our giving be... Are contaminated by the idea that it has to be something. So often we, when we give, we think, oh, it has to be what they want. Is it the right colour? Do they really need it? And so on. In the end, that doesn't matter. It's how we give it, rather than what we give. But of course, if you give what is needed, is very, very use, is a, is an important thing. As a monk, I see this a lot because in Buddhist societies, uh, Buddhist countries, there's a lot of things that are given traditionally. We call them, for instance, in Sri Lanka, atapirikara. They cost a lot. This is a bowl, the robes, three robes, a belt, um, and a few other things. There's eight of them. And people give them, but they give them in such quantity. Who could use them all? And, and in actual fact, it turns out to be a burden in the end for the monastery. You don't want to not receive it, but what, what, what do you do with all this? So... So this is giving, which is not informed by the idea of need. But the Buddha praised that sort of giving. And I always say, you know, nice, if, we're, say, a group of people give one, that's great. 
But I heard of, for instance, there was a ceremony in the village. It was done by bhikkhunis, actually, and they organized the lay people as well. They gave 80 sets of these atapirikara, and they're really expensive in Sri Lanka. And this monastery, well, it has got 30, uh, this is in the village, 30 monks, you know, 23 or 24 of the small monks, they're called Podihamdras, novices, and uh, then some, uh, the rest were uh, fully ordained monks, older monks. But 80 sets, I thought, wow. But, but what I, when I hear that, I think it's wonderful the faith they give it with, you know. Because I know, I've seen them in the village when they, when they give one of these atapirikara, they go around and ask people for, to, um, you know, to contribute because they can't afford it themselves. And it brings the village together and they give from faith. So the, the giving is good. But it's nice, it is also important to keep the idea of need in, in mind as well, so that we don't burden, <laughs> burden the Sangha with, you know, these, all the gifts, those gifts, those sorts of gifts. So thank you very much. I don't know if that answered your question. Do you have anything else in mind? Or? I guess what I was thinking from mm. that was sometimes you um, end up in a situation where you give, yeah, and then there's a, you walk away and there's this dialogue that's going in your head, did I give enough? Oh, right. yeah. Then, you know, that, that's kind of like it pollutes the whole giving. Yep. Yeah. So that's, yeah. So that's, a, that's a very good point. It, it's a similar thing to that. What pollutes too is that idea, is it the right gift? We get right colour. <laughs> Do they really need this? Have they already got one? Is it the right size? <laughs> but yes, yeah. And yes, one can feel like that. But I think um, in those cases, just to see that and just to keep in mind, it's the joy just to give Give wholeheartedly, and you know, um, not to you know, not to pollute it, as you say. It's not easy, because some of that's coming, you know, from our, our baggage, our emotional baggage, isn't it? You know, that uh, perhaps from childhood, whatever we gave to our parents or whoever was never enough, or it seemed like never enough, because. We focus on them wanting to appreciate, saying, oh, it's just what I needed. <laughs> I'm sure parents say that all the time <laughs> when it isn't at all, but nevertheless. But they may not say that. And so, you know, the message that children can pick up at a very young age, we all do actually, is it's not enough, it's not good enough, or, you know, it's not appreciated. But as an adult, we can focus on our side of the equation, which is where we're coming from. How other people receive our gifts, we can't, that's up to them. That's their conditioning. That's their karma. <laughs> so that's the best we can do. But when we hear those messages, you know, like it's not good enough, we have to investigate and say, well, where is this coming from? What's the cause? Is it, is it something that my parents said to me or I picked up at school, you know, the teachers, whatever I did, they're never happy with it. Because it's a message that's coming from somewhere. And in Buddhism, of course, we're looking at the causes, the conditions. This is the way we can... Um, affect the results. So if you understand that this cause and condition is giving rise to this result now that I feel it's not, not enough, not good enough, we can undo that. We can see it with wisdom, with the maturity of um, an adult. Adult, We're no longer the child who just believes that or has that feeling, picks up on that emotion that, oh, it's not good enough, they didn't like it, they didn't smile, they didn't say thank you or whatever it is. So very important, actually. I think it's very good, very good that we don't pollute our giving and we realise we, we do our best. Oh, look at this. Um, we do our best. And it's where we're coming from that's important. Where we, and that's the gift sometimes, isn't it? I get, when I'm in the uh, Vindapata, going on the arms around in the village, sometimes people give with such joy. It doesn't matter what they give. How little, how much doesn't matter at all. Just that wonderful way they're giving. And it's so true of any present anyone gives another person. Often it's the way they give, where they're coming from, that really impacts, is really the present, is really the message, actually. So uh, that's what we should focus on, you know, and not be drawn out um, to, to what we really never know. Does the other person think this is not good enough? No, we, they probably don't, they may not. They may just think, oh, how wonderful he thought about me. <laughs> and, and that's enough, you know. So whatever their reaction is, is their business, you know. Our business is to develop wholesome, positive mind states and hopefully other people, that's their business too. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. That was a good question. I... Yes. Um, 
with you, Pamshan and Swami. I like to hear from you yes. how to give without mm. attaching ego to the giving. Ah, right. How okay. do you how do you give without attaching ego to the gift? To the gift. To give um, sort of selflessly. This is sort of the idea. How do you do that? Is when you when you when we're giving, we look at where we're coming from, you know. And the the Buddha said the the way we can determine if something is unwholesome or wholesome is where the root it's coming from. And if it's coming from greed, you know, or hatred or delusion, this is the negative roots. And he said these are not to be encouraged. They will not lead to our happiness and well-being. But if they're coming from non-greed, you know, from desire, generosity. Um, uh, wanting to share, and if it's coming from non-hatred, like loving kindness, compassion, those things, and not coming from delusion. Now, delusion is often a sense, a strong sense of self, you know, and uh, that that enables. That's a great enabler for the greed. <laughs> I want. I don't want. These are the two primary uh, forces in our lives. I want. I don't want. It's the enabler this delusion that there is this permanent self in here who's running the show, it's got control over things. Forget about causes and conditions. I'm doing it. <laughs> so how do we avoid that contamination from, uh, or pollution, as, as you were saying before, is to just see where it is coming from. Is it, do I want something out of the situation or, or am I trying not, am I trying to reject something? And then uh, if, we, if we see that, if we see that clearly, then we can um, try and let go of that, try and uh, avoid coming from those roots, actually. Because, as I say, self is what will, mot will enable those two negative roots in a very, very strong way, in a very strong way. Um, so this is, this is something that you see often in Buddhist countries, too, when people give, and you see it in Sri Lanka a lot. I think it's probably true in Thailand, maybe true in Burma too. When they give to, a, say, a monastery or a meditation centre or something, they're like a plaque. <laughs> they want their name up there. <laughs> and this is very common. This is very common. And, uh, you know, I think, well, you know, all right. <laughs> At least they're giving, they're doing good. And even though there may be a strong sense of self attached to it. And that, of course, reduces the... Uh, the uh, the karmic result because when we give and we want something back what do we want back if we have a lot of self involved I want a good reputation I want people to know I gave that I, you know it's possible because of me that sort of thing so that is not giving that's uh, um, wholeheartedly that's not that's giving expecting something in return and when we expect something in return we can always be disappointed too to be honest so some people just may feel like I never got back what I wanted from donating that new uh, meditation or that new dana sala or whatever it is. So, but I, in Sri Lanka, there is, a, I know some um, daikas, these are like uh, lay supporters, and uh, one of the, they give a lot to monasteries, to, to Buddhist causes, to publishing Dhamma books and everything. And um, I know these people even offered, they're very wealthy, they offered the Ajahn Brahma Meditation Center even. He said, no thank you. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> but their only condition, when they, well, I was there when they, they offered this to Ajahn Brahma, actually this was a few years back, and he said that. And the only condition they attached to it was that their name should not be mentioned at all. Totally anonymous. They didn't want them, anyone to know that they had done it. And that's usually the, that's usually the bottom line that they they say with all their activities. You know, they'll do it if they want to mention their names, and they won't do it. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. You know, I don't know about you. When I hear that, I feel a lot of you know joy. I think fantastic. I feel inspired actually. So this is this is, and so really, you know, how we avoid that is understanding that this is polluting the act of giving. And in actual fact, when we do that, we're actually reducing the strength, the power of it by this ego, the sense of what I'm going to get out of it. This is what ego wants, <laughs> what I'm going to get out of it. And when we don't have that, we know, ah, the gift is so much pure. The other person 
or the situation we were offering it in can really benefit, get a lot from it. So that's what I would say, you know, just to use your wisdom to see that it's, not, it's giving with conditions and that's reducing the happiness you can actually get from giving, actually reducing it. So, and it's also, as I say, it's, it's putting your happiness in jeopardy because you're relying on the other people to appreciate it, to give you the feedback, yep, fantastic, just what I needed. They may say nothing. Well, they may say, you could have done this, you could have done that. You know, why did you do this? So on. So don't put your happiness in their hands. As, as Ajahn Brahm says, you know, we, we don't, um, uh, what's his saying is, don't let other people control your happiness. How do we do that? We work on our side of the equation. Their side? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. It's all a matter of their conditioning and uh, where they're coming from that we can't control. So, so are there any other questions from the floor or from the... No, nobody on the internet? That's good. There's probably... I thought there might be a few people at home huddled around the heater or still in bed with the electric blanket on. <laughs> so hello to you, all you people out there, if there are some. So that's good. It's very convenient to have the internet, to have live streaming and so on. But, I will say this, it's no substitute for being here. So those that are watching this live stream, it's no substitute because what do you miss out on? You miss out on the atmosphere, the presence. And I really was very much aware of that Thursday night when Rabina Curtin was here. She was giving a talk on karma. She was a very forceful, uh, very clear teacher. But I wanted to be here so I could just get an idea of her presence, where, she, where I felt she was coming from. I don't know. But when you're with a person, you've got an idea. You, know, you get a feeling for that. But if you're on the internet, if you're watching it from, from bed or wherever, <laughs> you, don't, you won't get that, actually. You'll miss out on that. So live is always the best. And also I say with live, you're here in the room, your attention's here. If you're at home and you're watching it, the phone can ring, the, the kids can come in, you know, whatever. Many disturbances can occur. So your attention's not here as much as when you're in a live situation. So... Very good to you for all coming today on a very uh, cold day, very chilly, wet day, so thank you.